welcome Cash Patel <laughs> to to Battleground. This is my podcast, and we've been doing it for about a, like a month now, and. We're basically doing this show from CPAC, which is an amazing thing, and I have an amazing guest, Cash Patel. Um, you've done so Thanks much. Thanks so much for having yeah, me. So, I really appreciate oh, it. Oh, man. It's like, great. So we were talking over by the War Room, yeah. uh, war room booth, which has just been a madhouse. <laughs> like, so reading a lot about you, trying to get a sense of the direction I wanted to take mm. the interview. but. What jumped out me the mo at me the most was you're an ice hockey f guy. Uh, like yeah. I've been playing ice hockey like my entire life, and so like I want to start there. Like when did you <laughs> get interested in the sport? I don't think anybody ever asked me that. Um, so my parents uh, were Indian by background, but my parents were born and raised in East Africa. My dad was a huge field hockey player in Uganda, and Idi Amin came to power in the '70s. He was a dictator, literally genocide, and he had to flee. So you know where he went? Toronto. And he had never left East Africa before. He's sitting in Toronto, never experienced the winter, trying to figure out what to watch and what to do. And of course, you're in Toronto in the 70s yeah. and 80s. It's like ice hockey. Yeah. And then, long story short, he had me, he met my mom, got married, moved down to New York, uh, started a family. And then he was just like, okay, I don't know what to do here. I'm an immigrant. And it seems like a big part of the community is sports. Yeah. So you're going to skate. And that was it. So your dad went from playing field hockey yeah. in Uganda, yeah. in Africa, moved to Toronto. Yeah. Did he himself jump, make the transition to the ice? Or no, did he just- I think he, he just took a shine to the sport. He was like, oh, this is actually pretty cool stuff. And so when, so did, you start, when did you start playing? I started skating before I could walk. My dad was just like, we're just going. And the cool part about this is my dad waited in line in Canada to emigrate here lawfully. Didn't, you know, back in those days, you could just jump. Yeah. And he was like, no, I, he spent three some, three winters up there making furniture just to get the family uh, set up to move down here. So I think he'd always had that spirit in him about, okay, the American dream is for us, but the family needs to be American. Yeah. And what do we do? We, we play sports. I so mean, that was it. What an amazing journey that you had. Like, yeah. Which is, I also just think it's fascinating that hockey is, is a central part of of that bio, especially in the early still days. Still play. You still play. I like, coached for six years. How do you coach? You, what, what leagues are you coaching? I, I used to coach uh, tier one AAA. I coached uh, high school, travel, that, all of it. You know, that you is, just love it. It's yeah, just great. If I, so if, I could, if I could do anything, I'd quit. Yeah. I'd move to like, <laughs> you know, northern Minnesota and coach college hockey and be the happiest person on earth. This is so crazy to me because like, I, I played hockey my entire life as well. And I'm a huge, I mean, from Pittsburgh. Yeah. Like I got into hockey like probably in sixth grade like in the 19, early 1990s oh, yeah. were Lemieux and Yarmer Yager and, and what teams. yeah like we won two Stanley Cups in a row started, and I, you know, I started playing when I was 12 but then you know and I the sport just captivated me and I played everything I played right. I'd, I'd wrestled before that played oh, baseball wow. before that played a lot of different sports but I got into hockey and it just changed my life and now my sons play like oh I've that's got a, cool yeah yeah so the craziest thing in the world Cash is that like I like I'm going back to the ranks that I came up in and they're starting in their in-house leagues them. there. So it's just crazy to me. Um, it was the one constant. I'll, I'll say this one last thing about hockey. It was the one con On Sunday night, when I was at the White House finally, and Sunday nights would roll around and the president would try to find me. <laughs> yeah. I'd be like, sir, I am on call every day, including Sundays, except the very late evening where Sundays are for God, hockey, and beer, not in that order. <laughs> And I will resurface back on very early Monday morning. It was, but it kept your sanity. It was just you're out, you know. And and people might think it's like a funny joke or why do you do that? But you understand it. It it keeps you able to do the mission that you needed to do at work every yeah. day. Well, in your in your mission at, at work, like, did you ever think that you would go from this, <laughs> your, like your father <laughs> playing field hockey no. in Uganda, Toronto, America? Um, I mean, obviously law school. Then working in Donald Trump's White House, oh. and, and like you're his guy. He goes, I mean, and I, you know, I've talked to President Trump, like he's called me before, I've had meetings with him, but you've clearly had his ear during his four years in the White House. And I think you've been able to, to expose some elements of the, not, not, maybe not some, but elements of the administrative state that before he was president, yeah. I never, people didn't I know. never really thought existed. And so, 
you look at all of the things that the FBI is doing now, mm -hmm. or did with Twitter, with the, and it was yeah. exposed with the Twitter files and things yeah. like that. Like, what did, how did you react to all of that, Cash? Like, when you, because you, you're like, could you see very clearly what was happening in the moment? Because when you're living through that stuff, yeah. there's always a cloud around you and you're trying to figure it out. Or did you know that there were elements of the administrative state that were clearly weaponized against you? You know, I, always, I actually always say, I wish we weren't talking about a deep state or an administrative state, because then it wouldn't have to be something we have to prove to the world exists and yeah. is doing the exact opposite of what American service is about. And so I was a terrorism prosecutor back at DOJ, and Comey was the FBI director, McCabe was his number two, and Benghazi happened. And I said, and I was one of the lead in, uh, DOJ prosecutors on Benghazi, and I said, guys, I thought we prosecute based on facts, not on will or intuition. I want to prosecute all the terrorists involved for killing four Americans overseas. But if I can't make this case, what am I going to tell a jury? Yeah. And that became my first experience with the politicization of a prosecution and a failure to actually go out and capture most of the real terrorists that committed that act because they wanted a mount to hang on the wall to say, we did the job. My efforts were completely, you know, look, I said it. I said, this is my opinion, and this is how I would do the case, but there's a chain of command, so you all, mm -hmm. of course, make the decision. But it was my first experience to be like, wait a second, I thought this was the FBI, yeah. the DOJ. What is going on here? And so I left, and I went to run the Russia investigation for Chairman Nunes. And, you know, it's like best laid plans. Like, I never wanted to go to Congress. Yeah. I didn't even know Devin Nunes. I didn't even know who the guy was. Yeah. And here's the crazy thing. I had never met Donald Trump. I had never spoken to him. <laughs> I didn't know who that guy was either. I mean, I knew who he was, yeah, but we course. didn't know each other. Of so I said, Devin, look, I don't know you. I don't know him. I want to do national security. He's like, run this investigation. I said, no problem. I'll make you one deal. Whatever we find out, we put the truth out. And he said, deal. And then we put it out. And that was sort of the genesis of, I think, you know, I, I don't want to speak for Donald Trump, but I think that's why we get along so well on the national security defense mission, because we put the mission first. Mm -hmm. We didn't care what the media said. We didn't care what the media called us. We didn't care if they said you're lying. We knew at the end, like the Nunes memo, Russiagate, chasing terrorists, bringing American hostages, winding out of Afghanistan, that was the Trump doctrine. And he wanted us to get it done. And I think that's why, you know, politics, I couldn't tell you about politics. Yeah. I'm not that guy. <laughs> but I can do that. And you, you, know, you and I can talk hockey and we can yeah. talk mission. <laughs> I mean, you serve valiantly for this country and you get that. And the amount of people at the Department of Defense, when I left as chief of staff, that still call me today and say, we're almost embarrassed to put the uniform on these days. Well, Cash, I was good. so if you, you go to law school, you become a prosecutor, you're, you're, Work, you said you were working with the DOJ or on the DOJ, yeah. prosecuting terrorists that, yeah. that conducted the Benghazi attack. Yeah. Did the politicization of our justice system, yeah. did that shake your faith in the system overall? Like how has that shaped your perception on, on the justice system, on the administrative state, on the deep state moving forward? Like Where are you right now? Well, that, that was, that's what caused me to leave the, the Justice Department. I said, I, there's no internal accountability. Hmm. If the FBI lies to a court, or the DOJ prosecutor suppresses evidence. There's no internal accountability. And so I said, I can't be a part of this anymore, but I didn't expect to go over to Devin's staff on House Intel and find the biggest criminal conspiracy conducted by the FBI, yeah. lying to a federal court to unlawfully surveil a presidential campaign, being in bed with a political arm to do so and fund it. I mean, you know, like talk I, about third, not even, what is that, sixth world? Like it's crazy. Banana Republic fiction stuff. And I was so disappointed that it's the like cast something of out of characters. something out of an episode of House of Cards. Like, no, that's it. it it's, it's crazy. But it's like the same characters: Comey, McCabe, Strzok, the Hillary Clinton email investigation. All over again, these guys said, "What was terrifying? We caught them in Russiagate. We caught them a little bit on the Hillary e email investigation. Where else did they do it that we didn't catch?" Them? Exactly. Well, here's the thing that kills me, Cash. Nothing has happened to them. I know. But. Like, here you find yourself on the receiving. I'm sure you've been subpoenaed. I'm sure you've been the subject of investigations. Like, here, because you've investigated this corruption, you find yourself on the receiving end of attacks in the administrative yeah. state. So my question is, is where do we go from here, Cash? Because if you look at, like, you stand up to the administrative state yeah. as president of the United States. You're the president of the United States. You're the most powerful man on the face of the planet. At least that's, that's what the American people are told. Mm -hmm. You're the commander-in-chief, chief executive of this country. Yeah. 
look what happened to JFK when he stood up to the administrative yeah. state. I mean, Tucker just did a whole segment on the CIA perhaps being involved in the JFK assassination. Mm -hmm. uh, the CIA played a role in Watergate with Nixon. Nixon ended up impeached. You look at what happened to President Trump. President Trump was impeached twice because he stood up to the administrative mm -hmm. state. So if the, pres if the president of the United States, by the way, Democrat or Republican, yes. right, can't stand up to the administ administrative state and disentangle this country from their clutches, which sounds like they're e like something out of a TV show. Right. But where do we go from here as a country? How do we get out of this? Well, thankfully, we still have Donald Trump leading the charge because I don't know <laughs> yeah. that there's another man on Earth or in the galaxy that can take the shelling that he takes and continue to put the America First mission out there. But what we have to do is when we come to events like these and do great shows like yours, is we have to turn what they call the alternate media, we have to turn the mainstream media into the alternate media. And I think the way we do that, yes, I want accountability. Of course I want Comey and these guys in prison for breaking I mean, all these the people, law. All these people are contributors on CNN. Well, they're all paid over there. And, and the one advantage I think we have, thanks to President Trump, is he's running again and saying, look, I'm not telling you what might work. I'm telling you what I did and it worked. Now you got two years of Biden. Look at the stark contrast. All you have to do is a picture of East Palestine, Ohio, President Trump handing out water, and Joe Biden in Poland handing out billions of dollars of American fake, taxpayer dollars. Fake air raid sirens. That's just the starkest contrast. So when people say, oh, I want accountability, I'm like, yeah, but we need everyone to band together to get it from Congress, because we're not getting it anywhere else. The House mm -hmm. Republicans, I just saw Chairman Comer, um, are finally sending out subpoenas, are putting witnesses in the seat. That's how we're gonna get it. It's how we got it in Russiagate. Mm -hmm. We didn't get it from the DOJ or FBI. And yeah, we weren't able to send people to prison, but we were able to change and fire 17 people. And I think we gotta do that times, you know, probably 10 or 100X yeah. <laughs> um, on these investigations. But if we don't get the people here to do it, it doesn't matter. Yeah, so, okay, so I gotta get your take on Ukraine. You mentioned it, you <laughs> talked about Biden yeah, over there. Right. I'll give you, I, I, look, I am, I'm tired of, well, I mean, people call them neocon Republicans, I call them old guard Republicans. Yeah. Of the, of the, I fought these wars for 20 years, Cash, and the idea that we have to fight, we have to fight to protect our freedom over there, to keep the enemy from coming here. Like, I, I those cliches bother me a little bit. And especially when you factor in that there's clearly some sort of weird, corrupt, incestuous relationship with the Biden family and these Ukrainian yeah. oligarchs and, hey, fire the prosecutor and you get the billion dollars type of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, how, what do you think about, do you, do, you have a, do you have a sense of what the mission is in Ukraine? No, and that's, if they were able to outline one, then I might be able to say, okay, yeah. I, I agree with this and not this part. They don't have a mission. The mission is the, the full-on weaponization of the DOD and the national security apparatus of our country, so long as they get their next headline in the Washington Post and say CNN, when did the Democratic Party become the war machine of the I, United States of America? It's been one of the craziest evolutions I've ever seen because, you know, I, way back before I ran for office, when I got out of the military, I worked for a policy organization called Concerned Vets for America, and you know, we advocated. Uh, you know, for peace through strength yeah. in the Iraq war, the idea that we shouldn't cut funding for our war fighters sure. or balance the budget on the backs of the war fighters. Um, we, we helped write the Mission Act, which President Trump yeah. signed into law. So we did some good stuff. But back then, the Democrats fought us tooth and nail in the House and the Senate on funding for our war fighters. They were the anti-war party. And now all of a sudden, like the roles have shifted in the most bizarre way mm -hmm. where you have anchors from CNN and Democrats <laughs> uh, putting the Ukrainian flag in their bio. Yeah. And, and never mind the fact that, you know, the whole of our military, I don't have to tell you this, but just for the viewers, the whole of our military over the last two decades, I mean, has evolved to fight a counterinsurgency fight, which mm -hmm. is an asymmetric fight with, yeah. with terrorist groups. The war in Ukraine is anything but that. It's a conventional war that we haven't sufficiently involved our force to, to fight. Yeah. And, and I'm afraid that, that not only is there, are the American military not ready for a shooting war in Ukraine, um, I, I, I'm worried that the American people don't have a full understanding of what that would entail. I don't think they do. Like, you know, you know it's tragic that I say the following. I think Ukraine, unfortunately, is going to become the next version of Afghanistan, but for different reasons. We went into Afghanistan because of 9-11, right? Yes. That was one thing. That we stayed there for 20 years, that's a whole separate argument. Mm -hmm. 
the Ukraine didn't attack us, Russia didn't attack us, and I'm not saying we shouldn't help our allies and friends overseas. But my point to the American people is the following. What is wrong with putting Americans first? When I have 55,000 homeless veterans in this country, two dozen of which commit suicide a day, I want my money in tax dollars to go help them. Teachers, first responders, yeah. school communities. And then if we got left over, sure. But the Foreign defense H, yeah. industrial complex, in my opinion, is worse than any lobbying organization in the United States of America. They have hijacked the purpose of the Department of Defense, politicized it, and brought it to the swamp to members of Congress from both parties who now say the Ukraine is our moral obligation. No, our moral obligation is to your fellow Americans from when you sit in a perch in Washington, D.C., to make sure that our kids are educated, that our borders are safe, that our military is ready to go and not selected based on your gender or some box you tick uh, yeah. based on the color of your skin. We don't have the level of readiness and preparedness when you were kitten up. Not, we just not, don't have it's that. It's not even close. It's not even close, Cash. And and you were ground zero in, in the Department of Defense for a lot of these discussions, right? Yeah. I mean, you were the chief of staff for yeah. the Secretary of Defense and the what, in the later years of, of the Trump presidency, yeah. right? Um, when you say that the defense, we I mean, talk about defense lobbying mm -hmm. and hijacking the mission of the Department of Defense. Those, those are my words, not yours. No. But, like, um, what, what does that look like? What, why, how have we gotten to this point in this country where that is the dynamic that you saw and not necessarily a commitment to the mission? I'm not going to get the quote exactly right, but Eisenhower, President Eisenhower said, uh, brilliantly, however many decades ago, if you let the defense industrial complex get in bed with the monies making institutions of America, Wall Street, the banks and everything, this country will be on a downward trajectory. And that's what's happened. They have inserted themselves throughout the monster financial institutions that we have, and all of those together collectively elect people to Congress. Not everyone, yeah. but a lot of them. And then they employ dozens, if not hundreds, if not thousands of people in their home districts, and these congressmen and women have to go back and say, okay, we want this factory to stand up, we need another $10 billion to make this widget mm. and that widget. Mm. And I'm not, look, I'm the first guy to tell you the defense industrial complex makes invaluable tools and resources and training course, and kidding yeah. for our warfare operators. But it also, I'm the guy that tells you I've literally seen billions of dollars burn up. And we can't just keep expanding the budget of the DOD without having accountability. The, the inspector generals from the DOD were just on Capitol Hill this past week. And they were asked, hey, are you guys able to track the money? Where's it going? Well, we, we yeah. don't know. We can't tell you that it's not being used inappropriately. <laughs> what kind of answer is that it's not for $110 billion? It's not OK. And I mean, it, you couldn't run a business like that. Like, no. You couldn't run your household like that. But yet, and, and, and then you know, you see somebody like, like Mitch McConnell, who I but look, I got, a, I got a fine relationship with Mitch McConnell, okay? Yeah. But when you see him talking at the podium about how Ukraine is the most important priority for the American people right now, mm -hmm. how does that make you feel? Because I'll tell you how it makes me feel. Like, uh. I, I, I'm a stone's throw away. I live in western Pennsylvania in Beaver County, a yeah. stone's throw from East Palestine. And I saw President Trump and Don Jr. go to East Palestine, J.D. Vance, yeah. to meet the powerful. people there. It was powerful. It was powerful. And, you know, watch the clips with the volume on if you haven't already. You see how the people react to just mm -hmm. not being forgotten. But the idea that maybe people in East Palestine have leaders in this country that love, care about them, and invest in them. Mm -hmm. they, they were deeply appreciative of it. So, uh, to me, I see a divide between the priorities mm -hmm. of some of the leadership in Washington and what really matters to Americans. It, do, you, do you see that, too? Is that... It's, it's one of the most problematic things because it's, it's everything has become, in my opinion, when it comes to national security, defense, law enforcement. What did Trump do? We're doing the opposite. Mm -hmm. And what, the Afghan withdrawal is a, is a great way and a tragic way to make this example. Yeah. President Trump asked us to withdraw out of Afghanistan, but leaving our key nodes, leaving Bagram, not releasing the terrorists, right. methodically also have a diplomatic silo going at the same time of the military, and do it based on intelligence and evidence on the ground. Where's Al-Qaeda? Are they being defeated? What's the Taliban doing with our money, mm -hmm. et cetera? We handed that off to the Biden administration, and we said, call it, I was like, call it the Biden plan. Call it whatever you want. The success of this is too important for America. Mm -hmm. And they, were, they wouldn't even take our calls. Instead, they leaked to the media saying, Trump DOD refuses transition, which is hilarious because we ran the largest 
transition in presidential history for the Department of Defense ever. And that's the problem with the deep state. They put out that narrative. And then what happens? Joe Biden lets out the terrorists from Bagram, and 13 American soldiers are in caskets on their way home to Dover for a dignified transfer. That's the difference. That is the difference to me in a nutshell. I am I'm blown away by that story because in, in just like researching you, I did stumble upon that narrative. And I did think to myself like, oh, the narrative, oh, Cash, Cash Patel is blocking transition. Right. And I read that and I, I immediately knew that it was, it was complete garbage, but I didn't know the details behind it until you just talked about it now. Yeah. Like, how is that not a, just a very grave dereliction of duty? Well, that's what it is, but the media lets them get away with it. The deep state actors, the Mark Millies of the world, right, are in there. I, Mark, he, Mark Milley, the white rage on Capitol That's That's what Mark Milley will be remembered. The, here's the biggest problem about Mark Milley. I was in the Situation Room heading up counterterrorism for President Trump when we did the Baghdadi raid. And Mark Milley was a chairman in that room with us on that night. And I'll tell everyone, he acted the way a chairman was supposed to act, apolitically giving his advice, telling him the ground force truth so the President of the United States and Secretary of Defense could make a decision. Why I bring that up is because that's the same man talking about white rage, how climate change is important, and why gender matters, and what your sex box you pick is, pick is more important to serving and putting on the uniform than anything else. Because these people stay and say whatever they need to, to stay in the position they have rather than serve the mission. So, to a certain extent, like, do you believe, I mean, I personally believe that, you know, generals in, t in today's day and age, chairmen of the Joint Chiefs, like at the highest echelons, they're more, they're, they're focused on politics and, and yeah. not the mission and, and, and survival, career survival. Oh, yeah. And I have a theory about this. Like, guys like me who, you know, I, I went into the military cash intended to make it a career and I got to Afghanistan on the, at the height of the hunt for bin Laden. Wow. We got shot up every day, every single day, direct fire engagements, indirect fire, and like, real quick, like, the first firefight, I was kind of like, okay, that's kind of cool. Like, I can't believe you survived that. After the hundredth, I was like, okay, I got to get the hell out of here. Yeah. And what I learned real quickly is that the guys that don't go through that, the guys that have never seen war end up saying, hey, like, I'm going to stay in, I'm going to play the game, I'm going to make it a career. And those are the guys that become promotable, but the guys, those are the guys that make it to general. Yeah. And the guys that, like, get into some serious, serious shit, and I'm like, I don't want to deal they with this out. anymore. They get out. And so you're left with people who, at the highest echelons of our military, have may maybe never seen frontline combat before, or the implications or the cost of war up close yeah. and personal. And it's almost like an artist, you know, being an artist and never having painting, painted a painting. Exactly, you know? and they want you to you, they want you to be the new Van Gogh or the new yeah. whatever Michelangelo, and, yeah. and you know, and this is a conversation for another day. But you know, the Joint Chiefs of Staff needs a massive reduction in size because these people, the Gofos as we call them, the flag officers, they exist for each other. They mm -hmm. don't, not all of them, but a large portion of them don't need those stars on their shoulders and don't need the billets they're sitting in. What we need are ground level operators running the important strategic decisions of the Department of Defense who have the experience to tell leadership, political leadership separately, this is what I think, this is the chain of command, roger that, we're gonna go down and act accordingly. Yeah. Not people in between who are gonna subvert the actions of a duly elected president because Mark Milley doesn't like President Trump anymore and wants to stay in office. I mean, and that's exactly what happened. So I, I promised you cash, no, I got you for 30 minutes, yeah. he's got a hard out in six minutes, but before you go, like, give me, give me, Give me a sense of what you see twenty, how you see twenty twenty four shaping up. I mean, clearly, yeah. just all recent polling come out. Trump's still the guy. Like, don't have a negative thing to say about DeSantis. I like him, but here's sure. the thing with here's with DeSantis. DeSantis, to me, like has the luxury of something that President Trump does not have. He has time, and I personally, I think that the first four years of the Trump presidency were completely stolen from him. Yeah, he, he never really had a chance to govern. Yet, look at all of the amazing things mm -hmm. that he did for this country. So, I mean, that's where I come down in all this. Where do you come down? I look. I'm all in behind President Trump. I think he's the guy that puts the mission first in my mind when it comes to national security, defense, intelligence, law enforcement, things you and I care about, work so much on. And the thing that most Americans shouldn't have to deal with, because mm -hmm. that's the way America's supposed to operate. But when you weaponize it, when you politicize it, it becomes something to sell in the fake news media. So what I think President Trump is successful in doing is he's able to uniquely go out and say, hey, you don't have to believe what I'm just telling you. Look back at my administration 
and judge what we did. Mm -hmm. We secured the border. We defeated the drug cartels. We took on China, Russia, and Iran. We killed Al Qaeda senior leadership. We wiped out the emirs of ISIS. We brought home more American hostages than every president before him combined. These are America first missions that aren't political in any way. He wound us out of wars, a decades long war. So he has empirical data to run on. Now, of course, the media doesn't want to touch it because they know he was successful in it. But he has the ability, President Trump, to break through to that middle road America, moderate lefts even, and say, look, you know you're lied to now about Russiagate, about Hunter Biden's laptop, about Ukraine, about Jansen, Absolutely whatever, right? right, yeah. Now how about you listen to the policy videos that President Trump is putting out on almost a weekly basis on Truth yeah. Social. Amazing, telling the American people, this is what I'm gonna do with the Chinese economy. This is what I'm gonna do at the border. I'm gonna put the death penalty on the table for drug kingpins. Mm. These are ideas and solutions that America no just doubt. doesn't have in the White House right now. And that's the distinction. And I think, you know, when you hear him speak on Saturday night, you're gonna hear a interwoven policy methodology to structure an America first agenda that is just going to wipe out anyone else that's running Democrat or Republican. What are they yeah. going to do then? Steal his ideas? I, well, that's right. Uh, and the answer to that is that yes, because <laughs> you see Joe Biden steal his ideas in the White House every single day. Um, but I, yeah, I agree. I, and I saw it firsthand in Pennsylvania, having run for Congress in 2020 and then run for yeah. Senate in 2022. President Trump brings out a cross section of voters that yeah. I've never seen any other politician ever do. Yeah. So um, if he can do that again in 2024 and focus on voter registration deficits and critical battleground states, I think he's going to be successful. I think but, so too. But everyone, <laughs> Cash Patel, thank you, brother, for joining for joining Battleground. Yeah. You're out of here. Look, I promised you 30 minutes, no, 30 no, minutes no, of the no. thought. This is great. I really Everybody, appreciate it. If I could just it, announce my website so yes, people can Yes, me. please do. Uh, fightwithcash.com, fightwithcash with a K.com. It's my 501c3 charity. We're helping vets, law enforcement personnel giving away money. Check us out. All the content's free. We will post this if you let us. You got it. You got it. Uh, and I'll see you on Truth Social.